And David is with us, so let's open with prayer, and then we'll introduce the program. Loving God, on this, on this beautiful day, we give thanks for the gift of music, for Matthew's gifts among us, and for the chance for this group to lean into the gifts that throughout the ages Bach and, and music has brought those who, who seek to walk the journey as, as God's people. Bless Matthew, bless our group, both those gathered here and those gathered throughout our country, and bless us in our time together that we might grow. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, David. Um, we had some disappointing news on Tuesday to find out that John Solomon Collins, who was scheduled to talk with us about the recital that he'll be performing on the 21st, had a big conflict and couldn't join us. And when Matthew Robertson volunteered to join us instead, Matthew Robinson, who, if for you who you all who don't know, among us, is noted for the boundary defying performances that transfigure the listener, Washington Post, for his incited tempos and dramatic pacing, Washington class, Classical Review, flowing lines and dramatic climaxes, and for recordings which are exquisite in every way. His a uh, kaleidoscopic artistic vision has led to acclaimed performances of a vast and varied repertoire, often featuring inspired use of staging and uh, multimedia. His imagination led to being awarded the most creative programming award from the Greater Washington, Washington Area Choral Music Awards. And when Matthew said, well, you know, maybe we can learn a little bit more about Box B minor, which I didn't know, but then read, was when it came, was viewed as the most astounding spiritual, um, well, this is recent, uh, the most astounding spiritual encounter between the worlds of Catholic glorification and the Lutheran cult of the cross, and when it was first written, came out, uh, it was announced as the greatest musical work of all times and all people. So with that, I will turn the program over to Maestro, who will have to leave at 10, but I encourage everybody to stay. We can talk a little bit about the eclipse or what we just heard or listen <laughs> there, some more. There may be music dance. left over. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, okay, for being here with us. And of course, his really greatest accomplishment at this point in his life is the, the uh, five month old the, that I had. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, well, when you know Solomon, our wonderful choral scholar, is um, a senior at the University of Maryland, and senior recital time and exam time, and mm -hmm. Solomon being a college student, um, Andy's smiling because he he knows where this is going. Was was just a little overwhelmed by the events of 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 the time, and so bowed out. And so I'm I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, I realized that there were two things that I, on short notice, to prepare a presentation, there were probably two things that had occupied enough of my time over the last year that I could talk semi-intelligently about them. And one is the five-month-old at home. Um, <laughs> and uh, and if you want to, we can change the topic of the conversation. <laughs> but the other is Bach's B minor mass, um, which I performed uh, just a little under a month ago. Um, it's hard to oversell Bach's B minor mass. Uh, Daniel J. Grout. Did anybody here take music appreciation or music history in college? See one hand. So Daniel J. Grout was probably the most famous musicologist of the 20th century. His uh, textbook, A History of Western Classical Music, is still the standard in the field, read yearly by tens if not hundreds of thousands of uh, music students. And at the end of his career, he was giving one of these fancy endowed lectureships at Peabody, the Peabody Institute in Baltimore, when Peabody was in its heyday, when it was in its heyday. And um, he was asked the question, what are the 10 greatest pieces of music ever written? And he thought about it. He thought about it for a while. 
And he said, well, one to six is Bach's B minor mass. <laughs> number seven is Beethoven symphony number three, which caused a revolution in, in Europe. Um, and, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time with much of Bach's music, his organ music, his choral music, some of his instrumental music. And what strikes me is not that Bach is so far ahead of his contemporaries in his writing, but rather that in his writing of the B minor mass, he is so far ahead of his own writing. It's just this wonderful summation of, of a life's work. So you're seeing on the screen, this is the facsimile from the first page of, uh, of what is the, the mass in, in B minor. So you can see, see this in his own hands. But rather than telling you about this, I thought I'd let you listen. So this is the, this is the opening uh, movement, the opening Kyrie, which begins with these monumental chords and then goes into this sort of klongrom, this, um, this coming together of musical ideas of primordial big bang in, in a very um, baroque fugue. And you'll notice, it, while it starts with choral singing, very quickly the voices disappear and it's just the instruments. And then the voices come in. So there's that long extended introduction. And I, the those opening, excuse me, those opening chords, I think, especially when you're there in person, uh, are just so transformative. It's almost like seeing an eclipse, I hear. Uh, <laughs> so some context behind the work. Um, the first thing that strikes one about the mass in B minor is that it is its scale. It's truly... Uh, larger than almost anything Bach wrote in it before it. Um, it's uh, roughly two hours of music when performed start to finish. 
And it's commensurate in scale to his two surviving passions, the St. John Passion and the St. Matthew Passion. And it's in company with some of his late works, The Art of Few or The Musical Offering, which are these large bodies of musical thought. The B minor mass also contains within it this vast range of style that in which Bach is trying to summarize and maybe universalize the range of possibility of his music beyond what is functional in the German liturgy of the 18th century. And so in this, he uses a, a few main styles of composition that, that repeat throughout the, the work. One is stile antico, which is an equal voiced imitative polyphony. So equal voiced meaning that all the voices are given the same amount of prominence. Um, imitative meaning that one imitates the other. And then um, polyphony meaning multiple voices, polyphony sounding at one time. Um, he also uses high Baroque counterpoint. This is what he was famous for. This is the ornate um, virtuosic fugues that he's that he that he was really um, the highest exemplar of, as well as just these, the um, these this solo writing with vastly different configurations, wildly different color palettes. The B minor mass was composed over uh, an exceptionally long time frame. He began writing music that would become part of the B minor mass in 1724, 300 years ago this year, as he premiered the Sanctus. Um, on Christmas Eve in 20, uh, 1724. He would later write the Kyrie and Gloria, the first 40% of the, the, the mass um, and sent it off to Dresden for a court appointment that would, that would increase his prestige and income. Um, and so he was very fastidious about writing that out really beautifully. Um, and, uh, and then the re remainder he wrote in the last few years before his death. Much of the music in the mass is parodied from some of the music that he wrote earlier in his life. So parodied meaning you take the framework of a musical composition, usually it's notes you keep extant, and then you change the words to fit the needs of the day. And Bach being a practical composer, you know, Bach was writing somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes of music per week. So each week um, he would write a cantata in German, a cantata that would frame the sermon, frame the two hour long sermon. The, the, the two surviving passions that we have are roughly two to three hours long each. And, um, you know, during Good Friday services, they would play and sing part one, the first half of the Passion, then there would be a two to three hour sermon, then they'd play and sing part two of the Passion. And so the sheer amount of music that Bach had to compose is staggering. Um, and the fact that most of his music is probably lost is makes it even more staggering. Mm -hmm. To give you an example of just how much people compose, Palestrina, the um, high Renaissance composer, Palestrina, most of whose music we think survives today, most most of it, over the course of his lifetime, wrote over seven thousand pieces of music. So it just the sheer the sheer scope of of human creativity is difficult to imagine. But he accomplished this in part by being practical, by using the techniques of parody of taking music that he had already um, completed and and re retooling it for a new purpose. Um, and some of the music from the mass is retooled from some of his best early work, um, but some of particularly the credo, particularly the second half of the mass is relatively new in the last few years of his life. I should mention that, that Bach was also a, a, a very dogmatic composer, um, very dogmatic Christian. He owned the, a copy of the Calov Bible, which is an annotated Bible of the day, and he annotated it further to the point where at the end of his life, you can barely see the, the words of the Bible for the, from, for the annotations. Um, he, you know, Bach and his uh, folks of his time 
were not ones to embrace doubt, at those, as those of us who came to the 830 service might have heard about. Um, it was really about dogma and what was the what was the um, prevailing dogma of the day. It should be mentioned that he worked in a very um, homogenous community of Leipzig. Um, he probably never met somebody who didn't look or think mostly like him. And um, uh, Bach also thought of his role, and this was not just him, this was not just unique to him, but this was sort of all, all people in, in jobs like his in, in Europe and in Germany, Denmark of the day, that he was a musical preacher designed to affect the emotions and the thoughts much in the same way that a sermon would. Bach's B minor Mass was completed um, at the end of his life at a time when he was very much out of step with the musical fashions of the day. The, if you think of the music of Mozart with some pretty melody and accompaniment underneath it, that's what at the end of Bach's life was starting to come to the fore. And it was just not what he had spent his life doing. And so he's compiling this at a time where he feels or, or one can imagine him feeling as if his musical voice is being um, being overlooked. And one of the, the great stories of this is um, at the end of his life, Bach went through to immense expense to get his art of few engraved on copper plates so that then it could be easily reproduced. And, um, you know, a few years after his life, these plates were sold for scrap metal because there was just no interest in, in, in this music. Luckily, we still have it because there are, there are reproductions, but, um, but that sort of gives you an idea of how out of fashion Bach was in his day, um, it's towards the end of his life in particular. And it's also just, it, this is an aside, but when Bach applied for the, the job of sort of town musician in Leipzig, primarily at the Thomas Kirsche and Nikolai Kirsche, um, he was the fourth or fifth choice by the by the town council. And the other four, four or five choices are people who you have never heard of. Yeah. And and so it's it's really it's really interesting. And this was he he also completed it at a time where he was mostly blind. Um, and the church authorities, the people who had hired him and with whom he had frequently clashed throughout his career, um, were actively ser searching for his replacement while he was alive and well in the job. Um, and so had he been able to see out of his window, he would have seen his replacement walking down the streets of, of Leipzig. Um, so why did he write this large scale B minor mass? The B minor mass is in Latin. Most of the music of his day was in the vernacular in German. Importantly, masses of the of the Lutheran Church were much smaller in scale. They just um, they just included the Kyrie and the Gloria. Bach wrote um, many Luth four Lutheran masses over the course of his life. They contain just the Kyrie and the Gloria. Why go on to add a Credo, add a Sanctus, add a Benedictus, add an Agnus Dei and a Dona Nobis Pacem? to this mass, they would have no practical purpose in the Lutheran church of the day. Um, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, to influence the Catholics and the, and the Pope and, you know, maybe like get them to pick up and, and, and really glorify the music that he's writing. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure that he would have had the I think that like being being a very dogmatic Lutheran, I'm not sure that he would have had any interest in what the Catholics were doing, frankly. Right. Um, but so, uh, but maybe. And but it was so he wrote this work that never would have been been performed in the Lutheran Church of his day. He wrote this 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 work that um, that is as large, if not larger, than than anything that he would had written up until that point. And he very fastidiously, unlike with most, most of his music that was very slothfully written um, in terms of his penmanship, he was extremely fastidious about 
the B minor mass, about the art of fugue, about the musical offering. And, the, you know, this, this leads me and many others to think that his purpose for writing this was, was for his own legacy, for some sort of relationship between him and his music and the divine, a summarization of his musical ideology. And, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to a little bit more of that as I, as I continue through this. So, um, when we think of the Bach B minor mass, it helps to know what the, the scale of it is. And it's written for a large, large group of folks. Um, so it's written for chorus, which divides usually into five parts, occasionally into four parts, um, occasionally into eight parts. And it's unclear how many singers he would have expected to be in this chorus. There's <laughs> evidence for some of his masses that he probably, excuse me, for some of his um, passions that he would have expected uh, eight singers per chorus. But since this was likely never, the B minor mass was almost sure never performed during his lifetime, we really have no idea how many singers he intended it for. Um, and, but we do have a few clues by the other instrumental forces, namely he calls for violins, violas, um, transverse flutes, oboes, and the slightly older oboe d'amore, natural trumpets, three natural trumpets, uh, and timpani, I forgot timpani on this list, a natural horn. He wrote um, an independent bassoon line, which was something that had been very rarely done up until this point. Up until this point, the bassoon would almost always just play with the continual group. And the continual group is an interesting and important concept when we're talking about Baroque music in general. So usually, if you look at the score, the bottommost line of music is just one, if you want to pass it around, but just make sure people are looking there. Mm -hmm. um, the bottommost line of music is just one line of notes. And the from this line, a, vast, a, a, a variety of different players and different instruments would be expected to play from this one line of music. So not only would you have uh, cellos, gambas, the, the period cello, um, playing playing from that line. You would also have a bass playing from that line. You'd have an organ playing from that one single line of music and improvising the chords above it. And then you'd have um, uh, you know, other instruments, the harpsichord, the yorba, which is sort of a large guitar, um, playing from this one line of music. And normally the bassoon would have played from this one line of music. Bach was one of the first people to say, to, to write, it's an independent part for the bassoon. The other thing that I really find interesting, looking at the this photo on the left hand side of excuse me this engraving on the left hand side of the screen, is this is an engraving of, of Bach the composer directing a cantata from the gallery of a church, and this is a contemporaneous account. And you can see there are a few things that are really interesting. One is that they're using the church's main organ for accompaniment for this. And many, many modern performances use smaller organs. Secondly is he appears to be conducting with like baguettes or something huge there, um, which is, is, is rather fascinating. I will say that the first, um, many of you might be familiar with the French composer Lully, who would conduct by using a big staff that he would bang on the floor. <laughs> He managed to bang his toe. He got gangrene and died. Oh. I'm, I'm not kidding. This is a, this is a true story. This is a true story. Um, and um, so maybe using these little baguettes or what what have you, we're trying to prevent gangrene. Um, but you also see, you'll notice that there is a uh, probably a gamba. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five strings on that gamba. It's resting on a little table because there would be no end pin, um, no end pin yet. You see, you see probably violins there, maybe violas. Um, what you notice by that is one, the bows, thank you. The bows have a different shape than modern bows. What you would notice if this were more to scale 
is you'd notice that the necks are smaller, the necks to the violins are smaller than modern instruments. The bows are shorter than modern instruments. And then you'd see all sorts of trumpets, which we'll see a little bit more of as we go on. The bows look like bows and arrows. <laughs> yeah. So um, with an eye on the clock, um, how, how is the B minor mass constructed? So it's constructed in four large sections. The first is the Misa, the Lutheran Misa of the Kyrie and the Gloria. This is, if you recall, what Bach wrote in 1733 and sent out for a court appointment in Dresden. Um, and each of the individual movements have subsections. And then there's the, the Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Credo, the Sanctus, and then at the end is everything else, the Ozana, um, Benedictus Agnus Dei, and Dona Nobis Pacem. And in writing the mass, Bach, um, Bach is just a, a lover of symmetry, a lover of, um, of how symmetry can transfigure. And, um, and so his, from the very first section, the Kyrie, you see this chiastic construction, um, the Greek letter key, so the cross, um, chiastic construction where the beginning resembles the end. And beginning with the Kyrie, you have this opening Kyrie that you heard a little bit of. And then in the middle, there's this large section that's for, uh, for, for uh, two sopranos and this really bubbly, um, bubbly violin writing. It just that sets the the words Christe eleison, Christ have mercy, and it's this almost childlike conversation. And then it goes back to a um, stile antico uh, setting of uh, Lord have mercy. And then the Gloria section, you, if you look at this figure on the left, you see these individual movements, and you see how it's structured chiastically by key area, this is the key area, area areas used at the bottom. Um, so it begins in D major, ends at, in D major with, with um, in the middle, uh, are reaching towards G major. And you'll notice that there's, there's um, symmetry in terms of form. So the, the opening Gloria all the way on the left-hand side of this figure um, is written for the entire ensemble and the Cum Sancto Spiritu all the way on the right-hand side is written also for the entire ensemble. And in the middle, we have solos with obligato instruments. The Credo um, also has a very similar, um, similar chiastic structure. And in the middle of this chiasmus, in the middle of this cross is, is the crucifixion itself. And the text that's set is he was crucified also for us by Pontius Pilate. He died and was buried. And then this is the overall key structure of the mass in B minor. And you'll notice that, so each of these little notes it denotes the, the key center of an entire movement of the work. And you'll note all of the Ds, that there's a lot of this that is set in D major, the relative the relative major key to B minor, and actually not a whole lot of it that's set in B minor. The The term mass in B minor was one that Bach himself never coined. It was only coined after his death. It might be better, better characterized as the mass in D major. Um, okay, so we've now talked about structure. We've talked about the general context in which Bach was writing this work. Now let's talk about some of the styles that he employs in this. So Stile Antico is one style that he returns to again and again. This is the style of the Renaissance masters. This is the style of equal voiced imitative polyphony. Unlike Palestrina, unlike these Renaissance masters, Bach would often have instruments doubling the vocal lines for this. And when you, um, this was often reflected on the page in what's called white notes notation. So writing in a time signature like 4-2 or 4-1, where there's just a lot of white on the page. And I'm gonna to try to find an example for you. Um, so if you wanna look at the right-hand side of this page, which is what, what we're all gonna hear in just a second. 
So this is the second Kyrie. Right hand side. Right hand side. This is the second Kyrie um, from Bach's B minor mix. So first voice. Second voice. Same subject. Imagine if this were composed slightly differently in the 17th century. So that's one style that we hear Bach coming back to again and again in his B minor mass. The other is what I talked about earlier, high Baroque counterpoint. This is what Bach did better than anybody else. Um, and this, this is what you think of when you think of Bach fugues. And um, especially in facsimiles of Bach's music, this just looks like complete pages of black ink because he was trying to preserve paper and he was using a quill. So of course it would smear everywhere. And the entire page just looks like a page of black. Whereas what we just heard, the Sileantico, looks like a page of white. And so here's an example of, from Cum Sancto Spiritu. I'm gonna, I'm going to um, start playing this a little bit before the Cum Sancto Spiritu section enters so that you can hear the duet between the baritone the natural horn and the bassoons having this extraordinarily virtuosic um, writing, uh, which is really just astounding. And so you'll you'll be struck by the natural horn being unlike the French horn in that it doesn't have anything to do with your fingers. What I'm passing around is what the black note is at the bottom. Thank you. 
きれいに届きたいです。Oh no, I switched far too far. So, in the interest of time, I'll move on. But that's sort of that's what you hear a lot of in here.、Uh, on it's just all mouth movements with getting the different notes on the horn. Yeah, yeah. how do they do it? Yeah, it's all it's all lips. It's all lips. Yeah, isn't it wild? So, Bach also writes this vast variety of solo or duet movements with obbligato instruments or instruments. So, here's an example. This this Laudamus Te, which has writing for an obbligato violin and soprano. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that、um, in this, the soprano doesn't have the melody; it's the violin that has the melody. And prior to to this, that would be nearly unheard of, where the vi where the violin has the melody and the soprano really has a complementary material. So you'll be able to hear what I'm talking about in just a moment. So、this is the violin solo, and you might notice that there's no chin rest in the violin. The neck is shorter. The the bow is shorter. There's a different shape. Wings are also really out in pink. Beautiful singer, which is awesome. The same thing. The second note. There's no. What's Bob trying to say? That's just one example. Wide variety of of. Solos, duets that we hear throughout this. Nope, nope. Let's move on. <clears throat> oh, and then Bach was an extraordinarily dramatic composer. So,、uh, like Handel, he was interested in drama. He was interested in in art. He, he was interested in the in the drama of the Christian story, in the drama of sec secular stories that he set. So. I'll just play a few examples of this. So this is this is from a performance I did just about a month ago.、Um, if only because、um, I can assure that it it went the way that I wanted it to go.、Uh, <laughs> That's what we want to know. Yeah, do it. Yeah. I mean, how do you approach this whole thing? Well, and and what's so wild about this is Bach gives us very few clues. I'm going to pass this around. Try to find. You you can find it, but see how many dynamic markings you can find. See how many tempo markings you can find. Any articulation markings other than ones that I've added to this. But so here we have、um, the end of a section where Bach is setting the、um, the crucifixion scene of of Christ dying and being buried, and then there's a moment of pause. And then, immediately after that, on the third day, he rose again. It's very somber, glacially slow music. You can almost feel the breath leaving. It 
just had this really low moment. Everything's low as if you're in a grave. And in a moment, the text, and on the third day, he rose again. writing ever written for an entire section of that. It's pretty extreme. We need so much attention to it. Say, as you saw, most of the players would have stuck. And so I think the players are similar. Either Bach had bases he really liked or really didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and then just a, a little bit more of this really just keen sense of drama that he has. This this is a set Bach setting the text, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the, of the world to come. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Here starts the text, and I look. This is just really impassioned, good, good, bloody music. You might expect a the 19th century romantic composers. Continues like this for a little bit. Let me see if I can skip easily. Oh no, jeez. <laughs> Let me try that again. <clears throat> so it continues like that for a little bit and then it sets the same text. Oh, I'm right where I stopped, so I'm not going to try to do anything with it. It's only another 30.
somewhat like the mountain one. with how Bach ends, which is the Don and Obis Patsam, uh, give us peace, setting that text with, um, uh, and he chooses the Stile Antico style, the style of the Renaissance masters, the style of antiquity to conclude this piece with all of his forward looking music in it. So I, I have to go do stuff for the service, but once the music is done, you can just close this down. But thank you all. Two quick questions. Yes. How long did you have to prepare for this? Who conducted it? Months. months. Yeah, months. Yeah, but but not forty hours. You know, yeah. you can't you can't spend. Yes, yeah. it's mm -hmm. just so massive. Yeah, yeah. Months. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That was yeah. the answer I expected. <laughs> yeah. Well, months, but then then like concentrated few days. Yeah. Yeah. But, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, quick question. Yes. I read somewhere that his daughter helped transcribe his music. Some over. of it. Is that true? Some of it. Some of it. This is in his hand. This is this is not in his daughter's hand. Okay. Yeah. Matthew, there's one one singer in red. Is there? No. <laughs> They're just allowed to wear what they want to wear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's the here's the last yeah. movement. Enjoy. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah. Of course. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, my question. Wow. Here I was in the church. I was in this as well. We started a thing to build some walls around the team. I was in the stage. We didn't get those people. touched it. Oh, in the slideshow. Oh, okay. Well, we're done. Uh, the Lutheran Church has wait, a Let's see if we can, I guess, click to exit. Uh, I'm in the slideshow. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Here. Ah, what have I done? Okay. Here, here we go. Um, well, 
seems to be, are we at the end of the Here's music? The end. Continue it. Oh dear. Well, let's see. Bring it back. Huh? <laughs> well, I think we're going to have to talk with each other <laughs> at this point in time. Um, uh, just any any comments that we'd like to discuss, either from those of you who are remote or right here in the room. Uh, yeah, he Kathy. He was so prolific and we had so much of his music, but it's just amazing to think that there's stuff that's lost. Mm -hmm. um, I find that sad, you know, and wonder if, if I don't know. What have you ever got the whole little notes written down? Terribly yeah. time consuming, I think. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I have no clue about where, where we would find, you know, it's sort of like Van Gogh, how many <laughs> paintings didn't we find? But this is amazing. This is amazing. What an incredible creator and person, uh, you know, talent that, as we see, um, was not recognized the forces of the time, political, whatever, didn't recognize him. Um, it's interesting to me that they start off with the Kyrie Lays, though, and Christ have mercy on it. The same thing we have in our own service. Well, I think... So that's, they preserved that out of the mass. And this is how he starts the... Maybe, you know, forgiveness is the first step. <laughs> and it, that's what Christ had felt, I think, too, before anything else. Um, yeah. Um, anybody at uh, remote that would like to comment on um, the program, what we've heard? Yeah, um, I, I certainly think that if you didn't already respect Matthew incredibly, this has shown <laughs> a whole new dimension to him. And watching him conduct classical music just surprised me as the amazing talent that he is. Yeah, I think I mean I know some of you sing with him. Uh I I and I you know and just well hearing what we we have at Bradley Hills and then when the 13 performs and the success that he's had in that their choral performances, I think he himself is one of these a uh, genius that we should recognize. And we don't always do that. He is here here among us. His reach among the medical community is fantastic. The ability to get in really talented musicians. Mm -hmm. Isn't that raises the how did yeah. Bach manage to get all these talented people to play the horns, all the all the things. It, either he had had people to perform that or he had in his mind he had imagined how that was going to happen. Well, I think it was about. probably a combination of both, but but as far as his writing was concerned, that was in his mind. Right. And the fact that you could, the, the scope of... of Those were all court musicians. Yeah. And he never said whether he got the court appointment, did he? You know, he mm -hmm. said he applied exactly. for it. I, I guess it's implied that he did, because he made he did the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he finished it, but it was... He died soon he died. afterwards. But a lot of his musicians were on, you know, they were employees. Of, yeah. Of the Church of the State. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, those were the guys on call. Right. Yeah. And the, and the singers, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That was well, the comedy. But the church could afford it. They afforded the <laughs> salary and some musicians, organists, whatever. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I still to an extent probably can. Yeah. Well, thank you all for joining us. Don't leave us for a minute. I wanted to mention what's coming up next week in the coming weeks. Uh, we have Bob Deans with us, who you know is the um, director of strategic engagement for the Nat uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, and he'll be commenting as his write-up notes that over the past three years, the U.S. has taken its strongest climate action ever, positioning the country to cut greenhouse gases emission 42 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. He goes on to say that, however, 
Uh, we've had the hottest year on record. The catast um, catastrophic climate change is upon us. There, it's here with us. And with the crisis that's urgent and the job not yet done, what's at stake in the months ahead? And I know Bob will have data and lots of, of um, um, well, it's always so interesting to listen to. So if you can possibly join us, be sure to do that. And then on the 21st, um, Clint Kelly, our Bradley Hills member, will be providing data about saving the planet with resources from space. Uh, just uh, hard to even grasp what, but Clint has it there. He's, can, he can explain what the possibilities are. And uh, I don't think we, we're going to want to miss that. And then the, at the end of the month, we have Allison McKinney Tim um, speaking about the, the critical uh, nature of the Equal Rights Amendment and the possibilities for actually implementing and passing that. So thank you all for joining us this morning. It's been a thank great you, pleasure. Yeah. And uh, well, wow, you. we're so fortunate. As great we see. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way. Yeah. yeah, by the way. Yes, well, when, when Matthew said that, I went, oh, I think it's so hard to, to, to get him. Yeah. So uh, I wish we could have him join us more often. Yeah. We're just very lucky. But thank you all for joining us. Right. Really thank appreciate you. it. I wonder if Matthew's presented this before in the course of a mm -hmm. pandemic environment. Mm -hmm. He was just like holding mm -hmm. on. I know. Yeah. It's, it had a look of a dump of water. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. but, he also, but he also gets his pull together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, well, in the list there, you know, it's just really it's amazing. Nice. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's just it's a little bit of talent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I have to say, when he came up, and, yeah, the, the technology is, you know, we're still working on this, and he wasn't flat flustered, came up, and yeah, yeah, oh, he's okay. The setup, he's he's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. Carol, thank you for your continued oh, no. shepherding of oh. our technology. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we keep working on it. Um, you know, we have to thank um, Diane a lot. For this, uh, but yeah. So is uh, this should stop share. Let me stop sharing, and I'm going to end this. It's just a minute. We have.